If you would, open with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 33 today. We're looking at Matthew 12, 33 through 37. And it just so happens, by God's providence, I guess, that one of the most uh, important lessons and one of the most frequent life lessons that my mom taught me growing up is found in this passage today. And we'll, we'll see that as we get into it. But Matthew chapter 12, and we're reading verse 33 through 37. I invite you to stand with me this morning as we read the word of God. You're getting your exercise in today, I know. <laughs> up, down, up, down. But we stand because we believe that this is the word of God. And we, we want to, in our hearts and in our minds... And even as we are able in our physical bodies to set these words apart from every other word, these words of God. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified And by your words, you will be condemned. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. It is to us that lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. It it guides us, it shows us, it, it leads us in the way that we should walk. God, I pray that as as this passage here today deals with our words, Lord, that you would convict our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and that you would help us to use our words to bless. And to build up and not to curse and to tear down. Help us, Lord, to to feel the weight of of your words as they apply to our words today. And that we would use our words to glorify you in every word that we speak. Submitted to you, submitted to you, Christ our King, Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated this morning. I just want to remind you of the context here of this passage This chapter, Matthew chapter 12, began with Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath day. And this created a tension between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. And it began to heighten the hostility between him and this group. Because he had violated one of their sacred traditions. He didn't break God's law. Because he himself, he says, I'm the the Lord of the Sabbath. And he says it's, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Therefore, I have not broken any of God's commandments by healing this man. But what he did by breaking one of their traditions was he challenged their authority and their legitimacy. And though these religious leaders, because they had the word of God, though they should have recognized Jesus and received him as the, the rightful King as the the son of David, as Matthew told us in the introduction, that Jesus was the son of David, who would reign and sit upon David's throne. They didn't receive him, and in fact, they rejected their king and their Messiah. And Matthew's gospel tells this story of this hostility between the religious leadership and their rejection of Jesus as their king. And in the previous passage right before this, Jesus had cast out a demon. And when he did that, they accused Jesus of doing this mighty work, this miracle, not in the power of the Holy Spirit, but by doing it in the power of Satan. It was an accusation that they made against Jesus, accusing him of operating with demonic power. And we looked at that passage last week. And Jesus warned them, he said... You're in danger of of committing the unpardonable sin. You're in danger of committing this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And then he gives this teaching here on 
their words and by implication our words as well. And so three things from this passage about our words I want to share with you this morning. The first is simply this, our words matter. Our words matter. The Pharisees had made an offhanded comment amongst themselves. We see it here, Jesus, if you go back just a few verses in your Bible, Jesus heals the, blind, uh, the, the mute man, he couldn't speak and he couldn't hear. And so Jesus heals him, verse 22. In verse 23, the crowd is amazed, they, they recognize Jesus, they say, can this be the son of David? The one that the prophets had foretold was coming. So the crowds recognize Jesus' authority, but then verse 24 says, When the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, that's the Lord of the demons, that's Satan, only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. The Pharisees made this offhand comment amongst themselves, They didn't speak it directly to Jesus because verse 25, it says that knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them. It wasn't an open accusation. Yet Jesus said that they were in danger of committing this unpardonable sin, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. An offhanded comment, a comment made amongst themselves. Maybe they weren't really that serious. Maybe they were just sort of slandering him. Maybe they were joking, saying it in jest. We don't really know. It wasn't a public comment. It was a private comment. Yet Jesus says, because of their words, their words, their words matter. And it's the same with us. Oftentimes, we say things without thinking. We say things offhand. We, we say things maybe to, to get a laugh or, or to, for, for no purpose. We, we just sort of just speak. We, we don't really think. And this is one of the things my mom used to tell me all the time. If I heard her say it once, I heard her say it a thousand times. Think before you speak. Think before. Did, did you think before you said what you said? No. No, I didn't. Think before you speak. Matt, think before you speak. Something I still need to be reminded of even today. We need to be careful with our words. Jesus here places a heavy weight, a burden upon the words that we speak. We don't really think a lot about our words. We sort of just say whatever just comes out. It just happens. A lot of times we're not very calculated and careful with our words. But Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our words are so important that they carry with it the weight of death and the weight of life. Psalm 64 says that harsh words pierce like a sword and they can sting like an arrow. Have you ever had someone say a word to you that pierced, cut, sharp? Have you ever had someone say something to you like that and they didn't even mean it? It was just sort of an offhanded comment, but it it just... It pierced you. Maybe you confronted them about it and they said, oh, I was just joking. Oh, I didn't even realize. No, that's no big deal. I didn't even think about it. We need to be careful with our words. Harsh words can pierce like a sword and sting like an arrow. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And since it's Mother's Day, I especially want to encourage the moms today. Moms, be careful with your words. Be careful with the words that you speak. I know that being a mother brings with it plenty of opportunity for frustration. Can I get an amen? There's no lack of opportunities to be frustrated as a mother. Motherhood is oftentimes overwhelming. Can I get an amen? 
Nevertheless, that does not give us a pass to sin with our mouth. Just because we may be frustrated and just because we may be overwhelmed, and this doesn't just apply to mothers, it applies to all of us, it doesn't mean that we can sin with our words. Moms, please remember that God has called you to this great task. And because He has called you, He will also give you the strength to do what He has called you to do. And so when you find yourself frustrated and you find yourself overwhelmed, that's not the time to just give vent to that frustration, but that's the time to take a break and go get into your prayer closet and get some time with God. Take, a, take five minutes and go to the Lord and say, God, help me. Help me with these kids. Help me with this husband. God, I need help. And you know what's amazing? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our helper. That God is an ever-present help in our time of need. If we will look to the Lord for strength, if you will look to Him for help, guess what you will find? Help. Guess what you will find? Strength. Because God is not going to call you to something He has not and will not equip you to do and give you the strength to do it. Yes, it is frustrating. Yes, it is overwhelming. And how much more so if you try to do it in your own strength? With man, these things are impossible, but with God, all things are, are possible with God. God is your source. God is your supply. Without him, we can do nothing. We must, as Jesus said in John 15, we must stay connected to the vine. I want to encourage you mothers, stay connected to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. He is the one who will give you the strength that you need for each new day. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness towards us. I want to encourage you, mothers, let's be careful with our words. Careful with our words. Those little ones, what kind of words are they hearing? As we spoke them to the least of these, we have spoken these words even unto our Lord. Let us be careful with the words that we speak. Amen? Number two. So number one, our words are important. Number two, our words reveal our heart. Our words reveal our heart. This is what Jesus says in verse 34. Speaking to the Pharisees, he calls them, you brood of vipers. That means basically, and again, I know I've said this many times, but vipers, snakes in the Bible aren't good. They're bad. So you brood of vipers, a brood was, was you know, a, a, a collection of the offspring, the children. He basically is calling them the children of Satan, the, the Pharisees. He says, how can you speak good when you are evil? But here's the, here's the principle, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The reason why our words are so important is because they reveal the condition of our hearts. The Pharisees had revealed what was going on in their hearts by their words. They had rejected Jesus. They had rejected Christ as their king. They had said he is not operating in the power of God, but he's operating in the power of the devil. And so their words revealed their heart. And it's just as true for us today. Whatever is going on in our hearts is going to eventually come out of our mouths. If you want to know what your heart is like, if you want to know the condition of your heart, listen carefully to the words that you speak. Do your words demonstrate the fruit of the gospel? 
Do your words show, demonstrate that your heart has been changed? That you're filled with God's Spirit? That you're filled with God's love? Do your words demonstrate the fruit of the Gospel? Or do they reveal something else? Are your words filled with faith in God? Faith in His promises that you are trusting in Him and trusting in His character? Or are your words filled with fear and worry and anxiety? Are your words filled with blessing? Or are your words filled with cursing? Are your words filled with encouragement, building people up? Or are your words filled with discouragement, tearing people down? Are your words optimistic about the future or are they pessimistic? Do they have a negative outlook? Your words reveal what is in your heart. Ephesians 4.29, the Apostle Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. This verse says that if we use our words not with corrupting talk, not with foul language, not with bringing people down, but instead if we use our words to encourage, to build people up, to, to strengthen what is good, to strengthen what, what we see God doing in their life that is good. That's what our words can be used for. When we see God at work in someone's life, we can come alongside and we can encourage that. We can build up. We can say, thank you for doing that. Thank you for praying that. Thank you for saying that. And what we do when we do that is we strengthen that part. We fortify it. We reinforce it. Or we can just as easily with our words tear people down. Why did you do that? Why did you say that? What's wrong with you? You always, you never. We can build up or we can tear down. And the Apostle Paul says that if we will use our words to build up, it, may give, it gives grace to those who hear. That God can use our words even to impart a measure of his grace, the grace of God can be carried with the words that we speak. In Ephesians 5, 4, he goes on to say, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. This probably applies more to the men, as men typically can be prone to dirty jokes, can be prone to swearing, can be prone to speaking out of anger. No, it says that that is out of place for the child of God. But instead, those things should be replaced by giving thanks to God. Our words not used to pass along filthiness or foolishness, but instead be used to offer thanks and praise to God. So words filled with faith or fear, blessing or cursing, love or hate. What sort of profile do your words have they reveal our heart out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks now as many of you know it's no secret that I am a coffee lover and I use that in the most highest of phrases the the, the highest that's agape love that I have for coffee I mean I just 
I'm a coffee lover. I love coffee. There is nothing like a good cup of coffee. Amen. For those of you that don't like coffee, the, uh, think about, I don't know, what, 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 how do you even enjoy life? I don't know, but <laughs> what do you, I don't know, tea? I guess there's tea. Maybe, some pe- maybe you like a Coke. I don't know. But the reason I bring this up is when, when, when you go to buy coffee, especially if you buy coffee like I buy coffee, there's, there's flavor profiles attached to di- different coffee. Much like wine is in, is in the same way, the, the flavor comes from the soil it was grown in. So there, there are people whose palate is so attuned to the kind of soil where the coffee bean was grown and, and wine in the same way where the grapes were grown that they can taste and they can say, oh, this is South American. Oh, this is African. Oh, oh this, is, this is from California. This is where the beans were grown or, or the grapes were grown. Their, 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 their palate is so attuned. And when you shop for coffee, you know, some say they're, they're you know, have a citrusy aftertaste or some have this nutty kind of flavor or, or hints of of cocoa or, or notes of cherry or whatever, you know, and, ooh, I want to try that p- flavor and that flavor and, and all of this stuff. And it's just, when you get it all just right, oh, man, there's nothing like it in the whole world. <laughs> but when you get it wrong, oh, you just want to, like Jesus, spew it out of your mouth. Just there is nothing quite as bad as a bad cup of coffee. There's these different flavor profiles. The reason I bring that up is just to illustrate that different people have different flavor profiles as well. And our flavor profile comes through the words that we speak. What sort of aftertaste do you leave with people after they've interacted with you? Is it refreshing? Is it encouraging? Is it, do people feel lifted up, built up, their faith strengthened, they've been pointed to Jesus? Or when you leave, are they ready to spew you out of their mouth? Just, I need some mouthwash to rinse that flavor. Is it bitter? Is it toxic? Our words, our words, Jesus says, a good tree has good fruit and a bad tree has bad fruit a tree is known by its fruit out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks this sin here jesus says of speaking careless words in verse 36 on the day of judgment People will give account for every careless word that they speak. That word careless, it means idle, it means fruitless, it means barren. Are your words barren? Are your words fruitless? What kind of fruit come from the words that you speak? Is it good fruit or is it bad fruit? This sin of speaking idle, fruitless, barren words is something that I personally have battled with my whole life. As a child, I was always getting in trouble because of my mouth. I could not control my tongue. Like I said, my mom would say, you got to think before you speak. I struggled with that mightily. My mom would also say, again, I probably heard her say it a thousand times, If you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. I needed to be reminded of that often because often I didn't have anything good to say. My natural disposition, my fallen human nature, is I can immediately spot what's wrong with anything, everything, and everyone. It is my spiritual gift. 
And oftentimes I would give voice to what I saw was wrong. And it wasn't until much later in life that I realized I didn't have a mouth problem. I didn't have a word problem. I had a heart problem. My problem wasn't my big mouth. My problem was my sinful heart. And when I get my heart right before the Lord, what I found is I don't have a problem with my mouth anymore. But when my heart is bad... My words are hurtful. My words are shameful. My words don't build up, but they tear down. And this is the reason why your words are so important. Your words are so important is because they expose what is in your heart. We should examine closely our words. We should examine our words. First and foremost, this isn't a sermon about examining your wife's words or your husband's words. No, Jesus said, deal with the log in your own eye before you worry about the speck in your neighbor's eye. We should closely examine our words to make sure that they are demonstrating the good fruit of the gospel. The good fruit of the gospel. So number one, our words are important. Number two, the reason why they're important is because they reveal what is in our heart. And finally, three today, our third point today, is all of this is in light of the fact that Jesus says, judgment day is coming. Verse 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, People will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The Apostle Paul in Romans 14.10 says that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God on the last day of history when Christ returns, we will all stand before him. Sinner and saint alike, no exceptions. And on that day, Jesus says, our words that we have spoken in our lives, they will have revealed what was in our hearts. By the words that we spoke, we will be justified or we will be condemned by them because our words show the condition, the state of our heart. And our words will either show and they will demonstrate that we had a heart that was changed, that we had a heart that was transformed, that we had a heart that was born again by the Spirit of God, that we had a life that was transformed, that we lived out, that we spoke out the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control and faithfulness. I think I got them all in there. Our, our words will have shown that we spoke with hearts transformed by the love of Jesus or our words on that day will show. They will be plain and they will be evident that there was no heart change. And so this verse, this passage is a great grace to us today because it's a mirror. The word of God is a mirror. Does our, do our words show that our hearts have been changed, that our hearts have been transformed? Or do our words show that there has been no change? Because, friends, that day is coming. That last day where all will stand before Christ, sinner and saint alike. And what was in our hearts will truly be revealed on that day. And remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, on many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and and do mighty works and, and cast out demons? Look at all we did. And Jesus will say, 
that was just a bunch of stuff, but your heart was far from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. What we need to do is we need to make sure on this day, before we get to that day, that our hearts are right with the Lord. Because as surely as the sun will rise tomorrow in the east and set in the west, surely that day of judgment is coming and is fixed and you will stand before Jesus. These are weighty words. But the good news of the gospel is that we can get our hearts right. The good news of the gospel is that though we have sinful hearts, Christ paid the price for our sin. Though we are dead in our trespasses, though, though, though we have sinned against God and we have broken, our, broken his commandments, that Jesus is our substitute. Jesus went to the cross. He, he bore the price for our sin. The good news is that by faith in Christ, we can be ready for that day. By faith in Christ and through the power of the Spirit of God, we can have our hearts transformed. We can be ready to stand before God, not by cleaning up our words, which is the fruit, but by looking to Christ that He may clean up our hearts, which is the root. That God gives us a new heart through the power of the Spirit. And as we look to Him in faith, and as we trust in Him, as, as we lean not in our own strength, but as we lean upon Him in our thoughts, focusing upon Christ, when we fail, which we all do, when we sin, which we all do, we don't try to justify ourselves. Well, the, the reason I said that, the reason I did that is because they did it. They did this against me. No, we don't seek to justify ourselves. Instead, when we sin and when we fall short, we go and we run to the cross of Christ by which we can be justified. If we seek to justify ourselves, it isolates us from the true help we need, which comes from Christ and Christ alone. We have no excuse for the words that come out of our mouth. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was slandered. Jesus was forsaken. Jesus was nailed to a cross, and yet he opened not his mouth. I don't know what anybody's ever done to you, said to you, but let me assure you, as awful and as evil as it was, Christ has suffered more. And he is our example. And he opened not his mouth. And his spirit, if you are a child of God, his spirit lives on the inside of you. Which means if when you do sin and when you do fail, Instead of trying to make excuses and passing the blame off on others, instead you say, Father, forgive me. I have sinned against you with my words. Help me, Jesus. Sanctify my mouth. Sanctify my tongue. Let my words be used for blessing and not for cursing. Let my words be used to encourage and not to tear down. And when you look to Christ in faith, he will give you the grace that you need. Amen. Amen. The grace that you need for your words is found in Christ, in Christ alone. Look to Jesus today. Your words are the fruit, but they are not the root. But out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth does speak. If you find that your words do not line up with the truth of the gospel, you have business to do with God. And Jesus has made a way for us to receive grace. To receive the strength that we need. But we have to go to him in truth. Not go to him making excuses. Not go to him blaming others like Adam tried to do and so many have tried to do. 
but recognizing that we are sinful, that we are fallen, and that we need his help, and he is the only one who can help us. And when we do that, the Bible says that he doesn't turn us away, but that he receives us. And when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So to receive the cleansing, I must do the confessing. To receive that, I must lay it upon him. I must walk in the light. I must bring it out into the light. I must confess my sin to him to receive the grace that he gives. So I want to encourage you today, let's meditate deeply on this truth. Do our words reveal the gospel or do they reveal something else? Let us not just say, well, they're just words. No, they reveal a deeper thing, a deeper truth, the condition of our heart. And if our words are not right, it it means that there's something in our heart that is not right. And the good news is that Jesus is the ultimate heart surgeon. Jesus is the one who can give us a clean and a brand new heart when we go to him in faith. Amen.